Hi everyone, it's MJ the Fellow Actuary and in this month's vlog we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence. And I know what you're thinking, everyone is talking about AI. I mean you go on TikTok, it's ChatGPT this, ChatGPT that. It's like haven't we, haven't we spoken enough about this topic? And I'm like no. No, this is such an awesome topic. I'm absolutely loving all the videos out there. And I thought, you know, why not join the discussion and just throw my hat in the ring and have a few things to say on such an awesome and groundbreaking subject. So what we're going to be doing is looking at, yeah, what are my own personal views on AI? How's it going to be impacting the actuarial profession? And yeah, basically, I think just those two things will, will give us more than enough content to speak about for the next 30 minutes. Like I said, this is the vlog video. Try aim for 30 minutes, a longer format. Don't have to worry too much about making everything, you know, short, precise and to the point. We can have a little bit of time, you know, just to chat, have fun and, and think some of these things through. So let's maybe start with, uh, with yeah, how did I get involved in AI? And I guess I've always been fascinated with AI, sci-fi, you know, computers. In fact, I should have probably studied computer science instead of actuarial science. Uh, just about the amount of time I spent on computers. IT was by far my strongest subject at school. Um, but parents were very much insistent that I joined a profession and they were like, computer science, there is no profession attached to it. So they they weren't too encouraging on, on that front. But interestingly enough, my very first, I guess you could call it official job, because after graduating at the end of 2013, I would spend most of 2014 doing a bunch of small jobs for various different actuarial institutions um, around the world, uh, of course, working remotely. It was only towards the end of the year that I actually joined an office corporate kind of job. And it was an interesting interview because in the interview in November 2014, you know, they'd asked me what is what is Bitcoin? Um, I always like to say back then, all I could say was internet pirate gold. And the people that I would join in this company, a lot of them were computer scientists. Essentially, the company was building back-end systems for insurance companies around Africa, and the CEO had the view that it's easier to teach programming to actuaries than actuarial concepts to programmers. And what was great about this job is that, like I say, I got to spend a lot of time with these computer scientists, which very much was my, you know, my, my second choice when it came to, to what I wanted to study. And the interesting thing that we were doing at this at this company is we were creating something called semantic databases. And the big idea behind the semantic database was that you could have a lot more information with a lot less data. And this was kind of, it, it's weird because the technology didn't really catch on because data storage never became that much of a problem. We were always able to just make bigger and bigger uh, storage devices. I mean, I think this laptop I'm recording on has got like a terabyte of, of hard drive space, which is absolutely huge. And semantic compression or whatever it did, you know, with the database wasn't really needed. However, However, it was still very, very cool because essentially what we were doing at this company is instead of just recording all pieces of, of data and putting it in a big data, you know, structured database, we could store a limited amount of data in an unstructured format. And if we knew the links between different pieces of data, we could reconstruct that information when needed. So I'll give you a very, very quick example so you know what I'm talking about here. Sometimes what you'll do if you're in a normal database, you'll store the person's ID number, you'll then store their date of birth, you'll then store their, their age. Now, what happens is every year you have to run a, a query and update all the ages, you know, check when the birth date was and increase it if, if that birth date has, has passed. Now, in South Africa, our IDs, the first six digits of our IDs, represents our birth date, uh, the year, the month, and the, the date. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if other countries' IDs do, do the same thing. But the idea was that you didn't have to store when they were born and what the age of the, the policyholders were if you had their ID number. You simply took the ID number, ran a calculation, and you could spit out the age using the current date. So you'd say current date minus uh, you know, the first six digits, and you could get this person's age. 
which means you could reduce two fields on the database. And they kind of did this not just with personal information, it's just like a nice easy explanation, but when it came to, you know, what should the benefit be, how much should the, the premium be, you know, all these other things, they were able to rather calculate instead of storing. So I was fascinated with this concept of semantics. And when I googled semantics, I found two very interesting things. The one was that apparently they try to make a new internet called the semantic internet. And it was a, a huge failure, which gives me, you know, being a big crypto fan, we're like, oh, we're creating a new internet. I am aware that we have tried to do this before and we have failed. Um, but like I said, I don't want to get too much into the semantic web. It was a very interesting project that ultimately ended up failing because people just couldn't, I guess, agree on what should happen. But essentially what they wanted to do was make computers intelligent so that they understood the data that they were using rather than our current system, which is just, you know, connect anything together, throw the data and then, you know, have various software um, then reading it and, and trying to interpret it. They almost wanted to embed that understanding in the infrastructure. Anyway, the big thing with semantics is when you start to study semantics, you come across a very interesting individual. So this person by the name of Charles Sanders Peirce. Now you pronounce his last name Peirce, even though the way it's spelled you when you say Pierce. Um, so sometimes people say Charles Sanders Pierce, but apparently the correct pronunciation was Charles Sanders Peirce. Now chances are you haven't heard of this individual. The reason why you haven't heard about him is because he was very, very intelligent. He was very, very intelligent, and he was also quite insulting of, of other intellectuals. So his father was a professor at Harvard, so he learned maths and Latin and everything, like, I think, before he could walk. No, it was a little bit older than that. But, you know, at a very, very early age, he would then go on to create a new philosophy for truth known as pragmatism, which says the truth is that which is, you know, most useful. And he had all these cool, interesting thought experiments that people couldn't, you know, unlock unless they adopted pragmatism. But, and from an actuarial point of view, it's, it's fascinating to see the work that he did on statistics, logic, hypothesis testing, and, and all these other things. So much so, so much so that I actually, seeing that we're talking about chat GPT, I got chat, chat GPT up and I said, you know, how, how has Charles Sanders Peirce's work, you know, impacted the development of artificial intelligence? And I said, you know, he had an indirect but significant impact on the development of AI. Because Charles, Charles was like, what, very, very early 20th century, uh, late 19th century. And I mean, apparently he wrote a letter to one of his students outlining how electricity can be used to calculate Boolean functions, um, which was like 30 years before the first computer came out. So it was fascinating, you know, how ahead of his time was. But he added a lot to, to logic and reasoning. This is coming from ChatGPT. It says, Peirce's contribution to logic, particularly his development of existential graphs and work on deductive, inductive, and abductive reasoning have been influential in AI research. These forms of reasoning have helped shape rule-based systems, knowledge representations, and inference mechanisms in AI. Abductive reasoning in particular has been widely used in AI to generate hypotheses and explanations based on incomplete or uncertain information. So as an actuary, you should be getting quite excited because, you know, we use statistics, uh, which is going through, you know, data to try and answer uncertain questions. That's why we have hypotheses. Uh, the one thing I, I read, and I don't know how true this is, that apparently he introduced the term likelihood um, to the whole game. And like I said, he did quite a lot on statistics, even did a lot on maths with regards to infinity numbers. And I know this is completely off topic, but he drew the map of the world without disproportioning any of the continents or any of the sizes. And he did it in like a square format. Uh, the only problem is then like New Zealand's in all four different corners of the, <laughs> of the world. So not a very practical map, uh, but it has like the North Pole, you know, right in the in the center. Um, I always wonder what it would look like if he did it the other way with Antarctica in the middle, like what other countries would then be or continents be cut up in the corners. Anyway, coming back to, to Charles, um, it was this other part here where he did semiotics and knowledge representation. Pierce's work on semiotics had an impact on AI research, focus on knowledge representation and natural language understanding. His triad model of science uh, represents 
orientation, object, and interpretation had influenced the development of ontologies and semantic networks, which are used to represent meaning and relationships among concepts in AI. He also did symbolic AI and cognitive architecture. Okay, Peirce's work on signs, symbols, and their relationships had implications for the development of symbiotic AI and cognitive architecture. Cognitive architect, that sounds like a really cool word to put through mid-journey and get like some crazy surreal image on that. Um, symbiotic AI relies on the manipulation of symbols and their relationships to represent knowledge, while cognitive architecture aims to model the human's mind structure and processes. Peirce's ideas on signs and symbols have been influential in both of these areas. Then, like I say, he also had this whole idea on, on philosophy. He introduced quite a lot of things in philosophy, not only pragmatism, another thing called taikism, which was this idea that randomness is embedded in reality and it's not just an illusion of our ignorance. And he also had this thing called fallibilism, which was this idea that, you know, the truth can be corrected if new evidence uh, pops up. So crazy, crazy guy. Like I say, he was a little bit... Um, gosh, this is something like a conspiracy theory. He was like suppressed because he was, hold on, where can I get the screen back? Yeah, um, it's a little bit like a crazy conspiracy because he was suppressed because he was quite mean to to everybody else. I think like, yeah, he would insult Kepler, even though Kepler was dead, like, he, like everybody loved Kepler, the guy who showed that the orbits are not pure circles, but, uh, you know, eclipses or eclipsaloid things. He said, you know, if he had followed this uh, logical approach, it would have taken him, you know, like one week to figure out the answer instead of instead of years. And he was quite, like I say, aggressive with his with his insults, which leads me to another thing that ChatGPT did, which I thought was very interesting. I said to GPT, I, I said, what were some of Charles's greatest insults against other intellectuals? Because I remember reading his book and just being like, oh that's a that's a good one like i should remember that if i'm ever in a in a debate and i want to you know throw some shade down like yet yeah, i can't remember them exactly but they were like you know if you're going to continue uh, to hold that opinion then i'm afraid i cannot have a very high you know view of your your intelligence or like i don't know but the way he said it was really cool so i asked chat gpt like what were some of his greatest insults and it says charles was known for his strong opinions and occasionally abrasive personalities. But this way it gets interesting. But it is important to remember that his primary contributions, and it goes on philosophy, logic, math, whatever, and it says, while there may be instances where he was critical of other intellectuals, focusing on these exchanges might not provide a fair represent representation of his overall contribution. And it goes on to say, you know, like, it gives me a few of these things, but they were like, very much watered down and it says while Pierce did have disagreements and critiques of other intellectuals it is essential to remember that his main contributions were his scholarly work it is these ideas and advancements in various fields that have made the most significant impact and should be the primary focus when discussing his legacy now what I find interesting about this is ethics is creeping in to chat GPT chat GPT is telling me you know, I said, I just said, what are some of the cool insults? You know, like a little fun thing. And it's like, mm -mm -mm -mm. you should not be focusing on how somebody insults other people. You should be focusing on their scholarly work and not their criticisms of, of others. And that I find, that I find interesting. Like, I wonder if ChatGPT just came up with that or, or if OpenAI's researchers have kind of embedded this how would you call it this don't be offensive attitude at all costs into the thing and that's why it's got these these disclaimers um but i do find it interesting how it's telling me you know i shouldn't be looking at the insults when discussing his his legacy um but yeah like i say big big fan of charles sanders purse he's got a book called um chance love and logic really really cool i think the first chapter is called the fixation of beliefs which is amazing then he's got something called the irritation of doubt and it, it it starts becoming more psychological and like i said powerful powerful book um yeah i mean we could make videos just on the content of of trolls but coming back to to ai i remember reading up on all of this stuff and it got me really really excited got me excited for for a couple of reasons the one thing is i was like okay cool this is the first 
personal this is a bunch of research that's actually outlining how ai works to me this is these natural language processes this is kind of like the blueprint on how these things kind of get get built it's no longer just a mysterious computer magic that these things are working there is a bunch of logic behind it and i wanted to explore it a little bit more so i went and i did i did two things um, the one thing is I made my own little AI. So after I left this company, I programmed a very basic little AI that plays rock, paper, scissors. Uh, but the big thing was that it learned, it, it did two things. It learned how to play the game, or it learned what, what gesture to, to show, shown on people's past, past gestures. Um, but it also had a confidence meter. So it, it would, if it got the answer right, it rewarded itself by being more confident in um, you know the answer it did next time so it never had it never gave its answer with pure certainty there was it was always stochastic but the more confident it became the the less uncertain and the more certain it became however the less confident it became the more uncertain and it would always if it got completely you know scared it re would revolt back to just being completely random 33.3 percent for each of the gestures but if it became very confident and you know for the next turn, if you had played scissors and lost, it would know, okay, I'm definitely going to go rock with such high uh, certainty. So that was a little bit of the AI. Um, because AI, even back then, was such a such a buzzword, I submitted it to the South African Journal of Science, who they loved it, so they published it in the May 2016 edition. Um, but what I also wanted to do was explore AI. It was like, okay, cool, I made my little AI, my little pet thing um, that could you know think but let's let's go deeper into ai because i could see ai assisting on two other fronts the one front was the actuarial front um actuaries when we're building models you know we need assumptions we need parameters and sometimes you don't know what those parameters should be now you can use ai to help you determine what those parameters should be this is sometimes when you're training it on a data set sometimes known as as machine learning which, like I said, starts getting me into the other things. So I'm like, okay, if we can use AI to make better actuarial models, and it's this thing called, you know, machine learning, learning, I was still learning for my, my fellowship exam, um, which I had failed twice. I, I'd failed this, this uh, fellowship exam twice because that was basically, they could ask you anything on finance and it was very nuanced and there was like oh, a ton to get through. So I thought to myself, hold on, if this is the logic and these are the, the instructions, or this is the blueprint on how a machine will go about learning. Why don't I reverse engineer that entire process and create a study method from it? And it's interesting because I made a YouTube video that like was like the, the dawn of it, which was just like the core idea, which it was, you know, um, I think it was, uh, learn less, understand more, or study less, but learn more. I don't know, it was some kind of thing where it was like, spend less time, but get actually more extracted from, from the activity. And the way it went about doing that was saying, well, okay, how, how, how do you learn? Like, how do you actually learn? If you're very conscious of your learning process, um, what are the steps that your mind's taking? So, you know, you pick up the book, you open the book, you read, you know, this is the input, then there has to be something that's happening in the brain. You know, you're you're basically seeing markings, okay, and your eyes are interpreting these markings as, as letters. So then grouping these letters together and seeing that these letters are forming words. Now these words are representing concepts, and the sentence is showing how these concepts are connected to each other. And once you've read that sentence, that thing gets, you know, added to your additional knowledge base. It gets arranged in, in your mind. And then when it comes to you answering a question, you sometimes take another piece, you know, whatever the question is, you link in say, oh yes, it was based on this information here with a little bit of processing and my knowledge base and experience, I can now write out the answer. And when you start going through, like I say, consciously on what exactly that you're doing, that you're learning, you create this, or you find this, this thing knowing that, relationships are key when it comes to studying how are different concepts related to each other and it was this idea of a semantic mind map so a mind map which is it was almost there it was almost there mind map you know you draw the little subject in the middle so you say actually in the middle then you draw up and you say you know we do statistics and then you draw up over there and you say insurance but you just draw and you just link them 
semantic maps was name those relationships. Okay, so actually studies statistics, actually works in insurance. So you can see in the mind map, it just said both statistics and insurance were associated to, to actuary. But with semantics, you say how it is related. And if you say actuary studies statistics and actuary works in insurance, just because of that relationship, you can now deduce, well, the fact that I'm studying something, that something must be a subject. The fact that I work in this other something, that other something must be an industry. And this is where semantics gets quite powerful. So you've got the, the links, but there's also some more general links. So there's this thing known as the hyponym. And a hyponym is a higher concept. So insurance, the hyponym of insurance would be an industry. Statistics, the hyponym of statistics would be subject. And what's interesting is these concepts can now inherit uh, inherit a lot of things that are coming down from their their hyponym. So the example with the subject, I know that I can study a subject. I know a subject contains knowledge. I know a subject you know can be be used to to solve practical problems. You know, there's all of these things that I know just from a subject that the term statistics can now inherit, and this is powerful from an AI's point of view. Because what it can now do is if, if it figures out the hyponym of something, it can then inherit a whole chunk of knowledge for this topic, even if it knows very little about it. And this became powerful for me when it came to writing the actuarial exams. If something called a credit default swap popped up in the exam paper, and let's say I knew nothing about a credit default swap, I could say, well, well what is its hyponym? Oh, it's a financial instrument. Oh, it's a financial instrument. That means that there are probably a couple of parties that you know this financial instrument is connecting because it's a financial instrument there's some sort of probably you know value transfer so financial instrument is probably going to be regulated it probably can be price which means there's valuation methods and suddenly you start saying that even though you know nothing about let's say a credit default swap just if you know that it is a financial instrument you can start knowing a whole bunch of things now you're in, in an actuarial exam they say discuss or describe a credit default swap for eight marks and you don't know what it is but you just know what a financial instrument is and you can say oh credit default swap will have parties it'll have this it'll have this it'll have that you might not get full marks because you might not you know realize the underlying thing of exactly what it is doing but the exam will be like oh but yeah he's mentioning this he's mentioning that yeah that that's those things are all relevant to credit default swaps and you will get sufficient marks that might actually see you know, you pass the fellowship, in which case, you know, after doing the study method, I was able to pass it. Um, I actually remember I went and I did, I did a, TED, a TEDx talk at, at UCT and I was so excited for it. I put so much effort into it because, of course, these TEDx talks were going to be recorded. They were going to be released to the world. And I thought, oh, this is going to be such a great thing to, to share with everybody. Because with semantic relationships, there's the, the hyponym, there's the hypnonym, there's the meronym, there's the holonym. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these different relationships, each which are able to extract so much more information. And I did this whole TEDx talk. They filmed it and then they messed up the sound. They messed up the sound. So and then I don't know, they had students who were organizing it and then they never edited it. I got the raw footage and it's been something to do for a long time has been to you know try and salvage something of this TEDx talk and, and put it out there because this is 2016 you know looking at um, you know how how does AI actually work what was interesting I remember in in the TEDx talk was I, I was I, while I was going you know researching into AI I came across another Michael Jordan who was publishing things on, on, on AI and he was at Berkeley uh, University in, in America. So his name was Michael I. Jordan. And I thought that was so cool because, you know, he's studying AI and what better way to differentiate himself from, you know, the basketball player than to be Michael I. Jordan. And, um, and I can't do that because my middle name is Bayman and there's another Michael B. Jordan, you know, in, in the movies. Um, but I remember coming across this Michael I. Jordan guy and being like, no way, that's so crazy. You know, somebody else with my, with my name. And then during COVID, I had ESPN reach out to me to do, just, you know, talk to me because of my name being Michael Jordan. And they got me and 16 other people around the world who had this name and we were just discussing, 
you know, weird stories. This is what we were doing during COVID because there was no sports being played and ESPN needed content. And one of the other people on this call was Michael I. Jordan, uh, this old gentleman from, from Berkeley, and he was telling some stories about how I think he went to Japan and this hotel was so excited for him, um, only to realize that he wasn't the, you know, the famous basketball player. Um, there was a complete sidetrack. But coming back to, to this whole thing with, with AI, what I find absolutely fascinating is that it is grounded in logic. You know, there there is logic which I want to encourage, especially if you're an actor watching this, to go and explore it because you will really, really appreciate it. Um, studying hypothesis testing and you know induction and all of those kind of things, I think you'll really be like, wow, this is taking stats, which was such a dry subject at university, and putting it at the forefront of you know this emerging technology. And it's one of these things where I think actuaries. Look, I don't think our statistics is is good enough to be, you know, to, to contribute to the field. But I think we have just enough. I think this is the nice thing about actuaries. We have enough knowledge on statistics um, and enough knowledge on on ethics and enough knowledge on on finance that we can actually contribute to the discussion. You know, there's this whole thing now with Musk and a whole bunch of people who want to shut down AI training for the next six months, which I personally am very much opposed. Um, I think AI is absolutely amazing. I think it's great. I think we should put even more of our minds, more of our attentions, hence why I'm wanting to kickstart this con uh, conversation within the actuarial community. Uh, for those of you following me on LinkedIn, you see I'm, I'm posting all of these like surreal art images created by, by Midjourney of actuaries doing, you know, actuaries doing what we do best, calculating the time value of money, matching assets to liabilities. Um, I've got another one with coming up, like pensions and surplus. It's got all these crazy little images. So find me on LinkedIn to, to see these images. They're pretty cool. But yes, I'm very much of the opinion that actuaries need to get embedded in this conversation. I think we, we can add we're not like i said we're not the global experts we, we shouldn't go there and dominate the conversation we shouldn't be the only ones in the room but i think there should be seats in the room when discussing ai the ethics and all those other uh, implications i think actuaries have got a lot of value to to add to those discussions i mean will ai replace actuaries i mean we've had calculators We've had our statistical software, you know, uh, model building is a lot easier, calculating and all of these things have been drastically, you know, we don't do personally anymore because we rely on technology to do it. And I think the same with AI, the AI is going to come in and it's going to be a more powerful tool that is going to allow actuaries to be even more efficient. And I think once actuaries are more efficient, then we can start adding more value to you know other areas of society. It won't just be insurance uh, companies that can afford us because we can do a lot of work in a much shorter amount of time. So we can start offering our services to, to other industries. And I think our knowledge of risk and uncertainty and financial consequences can play a role in all forms of businesses. So if AI can make us you know more affordable because we now work quicker in less time and actually tend to charge on time, I think it's going to be a very, very powerful thing for, for our profession. Um, are there going to be jobs impacted? Yes. You know, and that is something that we need to, to consider from a societal point of, of view. And that's why, like I say, we shouldn't be the only ones in the room. We should have, you know, sociologists in there. We should have unions in there. You know, we should have people um, that are representing, you know, other, other areas in that whole conversation and you know let us all be in there let's all discuss it but i definitely think actually should be part of that ai um, discussion like i said we're probably going to be on the optimistic uh pro ai uh side of things um but yeah like i said very very excited with this technology we have here 29 minutes so this is the last 50 seconds i guess this is where i'm going to end off by just saying that i am playing with ai um so I mentioned in the last post, you know, what's my little secret project? Secret project is using AI to, to generate content, um, religious content, because I think this is where the AI is very powerful. The more data it has, the better its output is going to be. And with religion, it's had got, what, 6,000 years of content, you know, of writings. So I think 
uh, AI will probably perform best when it comes to topics like spirituality, um, you know, religion, worshiping, um, you know, churches and, and those kind of things. And I think those are areas where, you know, the logic and reasoning and rationale will be greatly appreciated, especially given, you know, the modern context and times that we find ourselves in. But that, that said, we have hit 30 seconds, sorry, 30 seconds, 30 minutes. So we are going to conclude the, the vlog. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and I will see you next month. I don't know if this is the, AI, the, the actuarial vlog or the philosophy vlog or maybe this month. We're just going to combine them both. But I'll see you next month for, for another one. Keep well, everyone. Cheers.